I'm looking here, you know, you can't see that there, but I'm looking in the front few. There's two tomatoes sitting there. I'm thinking, I better be good tonight or somebody's going to throw a tomato at me. At least they're ripe. At least they're not in the can, anyhow. Okay. All right. If you have, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to the Old Testament book of Joel. Jo Joel. Jo Joel. We've been preaching through the... Uh, the minor prophets. I'm waiting to get. I had ordered a uh, a DVD about. Have any of you heard this fellow? His name is Pastor Khan, I think uh, Rabbi Khan. He's, he's a Messianic rabbi, and he did a study on the harbingers of uh, ancient Israel in Isaiah, and he talked about 9/11. Has anybody heard that or seen that on TV? I've seen this fellow in one or two places. And uh, you've heard of, of Rabbi Khan. Uh, I've ordered the disc. I haven't, and, and he said, uh, they sent us a letter and said they've had such great demand that it's taken a while to get them. But I'd really like to show them uh, maybe some Wednesday night. Oh, I want to look at them first. I want to look at them first and <laughs> make sure they're right. But, uh, but I really, uh, I, I heard this fellow talk, and it was really amazing some of the things he was saying. That, you know, George Washington dedicated this country to God in the very place where 9-11 happened. And that, you know, people think, you know, Washington or, well, Washington wasn't built yet, or Philadelphia. New York City was the place where he dedicated this nation unto God. And the church that he did it, and I'm not going to get into this, but the church that he did it is still standing, and it's right on the corner of Ground Zero. Out of everything else that got wiped out, that church is still standing there. And there's, and there's, a, lot, there's a lot to that, and really great. So I'm hoping to get... I'm hoping it's a good DVD that I can show. But um, anyway, so be praying about that. And as soon as I get that and I look at it, I want to do that on a Wednesday night and maybe promote that a little bit. Uh, okay. Joel. And it really does kind of tie in because when we're looking at these minor prophets, <laughs> last week we looked at Hosea. And uh, as I said, these prophets are called minor, not because they're not as important as the other ones, but because they're shorter or more, more uh, localized. But Joel is uh, it's only three chapters, short prophecy, yet Joel gives us like a panorama of things this, that have happened and that's going to happen. And I want to begin just in chapter 1, and we're going to read pretty much through the whole book tonight because it's short. And uh, so I'm not going to keep it real long. It begins by saying, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethul, we know really nothing about Joel, where he was from, <laughs> whose dad, we don't know anything of his history. Uh, not even sure exactly when he, when he wrote his uh, prophecy. Most of the people think it would be right around the time of Isaiah in, in, that, in that time frame. And he begins his prophecy talking about something that happened, a devastating uh, disaster that happened to the people of that time, that, again, that we really don't know a lot about. But listen to what he says. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm has left has the locust eaten, and that which the locust has left has the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm has left has the caterpillar eaten. He's saying, listen, there's something happened in their time that was so devastating, they had a plague of locusts. Now, I can remember as a kid, I don't know, maybe some of you who are old enough, there was a movie, I don't, I, I don't know what the movie was, but in the movie, they showed a plague of locusts. It was a black, old black and white movie. It might be The Good Earth, maybe, I'm not sure, but, but I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I can remember seeing it in this, this black cloud, it was like a black dust of all these locusts came. And when they would have a locust thing like that, it, they would eat, the locusts aren't that big, but if you get a couple million of them, they would eat everything in sight. Now, around here, what, it's like every seven years we get the cicadas. Is that every seven years or every 17 years or something like that? Where if you go out in the park and all you hear is a k -k 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 them clicking in their holes and all the leaves. Well, they would get these, these plagues of locusts. And there must have been a time when they were attacked by this plague of locusts and as we read here, we're going to find out that it, it happened because God commanded it to happen. As a matter of fact, in, in the next chapter, he calls this, this horde of locusts his army. 
Now, you know, we sing that song, they rush on the city, they run on the walls. Great is the army that carries out his word. That's a really good song. We really like it, but we don't understand. He's singing about locusts, okay? All right, I mean, if you want to get technical about it. Listen to what he says. Verse 5, he says, Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land. He's not speaking of a nation of men, but he's, again, speaking of these locusts. Strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the cheek teeth of a great lion. He's laid my vine waste and bark my fig tree. He has made it clean, bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Because of their drunkenness, because of their debauchery, because of their turning their backs on God, God allowed this plague to come. And the prophet is warning them. He's trying to wake them up. He's saying, listen, this wasn't just bad luck, but this was God trying to get your attention. He tells them, he says in verse 8, Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord, the priest, the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted, the land mourns, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up and, all, and oil languishes. It was, bad. it was a bad scene there. Listen to what he says. Be ye ashamed, O you husbandmen. Is there no shame? I can remember, some of you remember, when Hurricane Katrina hit Louisiana, New Orleans. Remember that? And I can remember the mayor of New Orleans shaking his fist and saying, for all you people that think this, this is some kind of judgment. I mean, he was like shaking his fist at God. And the first thing that they wanted to have, they wanted to make sure they were going to have their Mardi Gras. There, were nobody, there was nobody saying, oh God, you know, what, what, uh, have, what have we done wrong? Nobody was repenting. Nobody was crying out for God's mercy. They were just, they were like shaking their fist at God. They said, we'll show you. And they did. He says, verse 13, Gird yourselves and lament, you priests, howl, you ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Verse 14, Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into your house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Boy, it wouldn't be something if the President of the United States would stand up and say, man, we need to fast and pray. Presidents have done that. Presidents have, Abraham Lincoln did that at the Civil War. Other presidents, George Washington called it. Do you know that, do you know that the, the, the first Thanksgiving, and I've said this before, I've taught this around Thanksgiving time, people think, you know, uh, the first year the pilgrims came and they, you know, had a tough winter, and the next, you know, uh, when they came out of the winter, they grew food and everything. They, they, they thought that was a Thanksgiving. That wasn't where Thanksgiving came from. It was about two or three years later after they got established and after everything was going good and they forgot about their God that brought them there. And everything started, you know, the rain stopped and the crops stopped and they called a fast and a prayer to seek God's face and they repented and God blessed them. And that was really the first Thanksgiving. Whenever, the, whenever God tried to get their attention and they listened to him. See, we need as a nation, we need to start fasting and praying and crying out when we see all this stuff happening. It's not going to get fixed at the polls. He says, Call a solemn assembly, gather the elders, all the inhabitants of the land into your house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. The day of the Lord. We hear that term, the day of the Lord. And in other places, the other prophets said, you know, you're, you, you, ask, you, you ask for the day of the Lord. You don't know what you're asking for. The day of the Lord, that term, is a day of judgment, a day of visitation. There have been many places in the scripture that be, can, could be considered a day of the, or the day of the Lord, a day of judgment. Of course, we know that the ultimate day of the Lord will be the return of Jesus Christ. But he's telling them, he says, listen, the day of the Lord is at hand and is a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our Lord? The seed is rotten under their clods, the garners are laid desolate, the barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Uh, yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. 
O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. This prosperous, this, this nation of Israel that he's talking to, to here, they were prosperous. They had uh, an army. They had power under King David and King Solomon and so forth. They had a lot of goods. They had farmlands. They had everything else. And it was all wasting away. They were losing everything. Why? Because God, you know, because it was like bad luck? No, because they had turned their back on God. Why is our nation in the state it's in right now? Because we've turned our back on God. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm one of these people that I don't believe we were ever like a Christian nation, quote unquote. But we used to be a, a nation with a lot of Christians and, and some respect for God, at least an acknowledgement of God. Now chap, ch Christian chaplains in the army aren't even allowed to say in the name of Jesus. I've I've I heard somebody say that on TV, and I said, I'm going to look that up, and I did. And if you go on the Internet and start looking up Christian chaplains, they're telling them that in certain instances they're not allowed to say in the name of Jesus. They could be court-martialed for that. Our nation is disintegrating. Our liberties, you know, we, we got it good. You know, we've we, we got a lot, of, a lot of stuff here. But things are disintegrating before us. Why? Because we've turned our back on God. We're trying to eliminate the idea of God out of our public consciousness. And it's, we're doing a pretty good job of it. It says, The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Chapter 2. Here it is. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Okay? Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord comes, for it is nigh at hand. See, when we sing that song, that's a rousing song. But when that trumpet blows, you better be sure you're on the right side. <laughs> you know, you better be sure you're, you're, you're on the right side of the line, you know, because the day of the Lord is the day of judgment. He says, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord comes. This chapter has two trumpets blowing in it. The first one is, an, is, a, is a warning. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong. There has not been ever the like. Neither shall be any more after it. Even to years of many generations. Again he's speaking of this locust horde. That came and devoured. A fire devours before them, and behind them a, a flame burns. The land is as a garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing shall escape them. When them locusts got down, there was nothing left but a bunch of twigs. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devours the stubble as a strong people set in battle. Before their face the people shall be much pain, and all faces shall gather blackness. No way to stop them. You can't stop them. When they come, they're going to come. When God's judgment comes, you're not going to stop it. You can't stop wind. You can't stop rain. You can't stop fire when it spreads like wildfire. Just uh, dropping down a little bit. The, the, the destruction here, uh, or the uh, description here of the locust horde. Look at verse 12. Therefore also now, says the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. What's the solution? When God sends judgment, when it seems like everything has been devastated, what are we supposed to do? Turn. See, when God allows something like this to happen, it, to happen, it's not a punishment, it's an invitation. It's an invitation. He says, Turn to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repents him of evil. He doesn't like doing that stuff. He doesn't like sending a Hurricane Katrina to tear the place up. But sometimes we give him no choice. He has to address and judge sin. He can't be a holy God and wink at stuff that happens. 
And when he does it, listen, it's right. Because he's God. And everything he does is right. We might not agree with what he's doing, but that's all right. He's, it's still right. He says, Who knows if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and drink offering unto the Lord your God. God can restore. Now let's read on a little bit. Look at verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Now, the first trumpet was a warning. Now, this, this second trumpet is a, is, a, is a herald. It's a calling. It says, sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. I, I ask myself this question as I ask everybody else. When was the last time you really hunkered down and said, I'm going to fast and pray? Fast and pray. It's not a thing where, you know, I, you know, there's like a thing, you know, there's like a movement, a fasting movement now. But, you know what, this is, this fasting thing, it's a personal thing. When was the last time you looked around you and said, man, I need to fast and pray? We don't fast to get stuff. We fast in repentance and crying out to God. God. Read Isaiah chapter 55 about fasting. That's another message. He says, Rend your heart, not your garments. Verse 13. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And he, he repents him of evil. Look at verse 15. Blow the trumpet, sanctify fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and altar and let them say, Spare the people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach. Let everybody cry out and say, God, forgive your people. Don't let us go up in smoke. That the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Where's your God? Took a look at the Israelites at that time, the nations around them. And they would see the judgment that was coming upon them. And they'd say, where's your God? Look what's happening. What kind of God do you got? He let the locusts come in. They didn't understand that the loving God was crying out and saying, come let us reason together. Now look at this verse 18. See, now, now we're going to start entering into, he's been talking about an event that happened in that time, this locust plague, but now Joel is going to start expanding his vision a little bit. Because Joel is going to cover the whole uh, panorama of history here, according to God's people. Then, when they cry out, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and what? Pity his People, oh God, have, have mercy on our land. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto this people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. See, God's making promises now. And the promises that really have not yet been completely fulfilled. But now Joel is expanding his vision says in verse 20, But I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he has done great things. Saying, I'm going to protect you, Israel. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid. See, we, we read the news now, and we keep hearing about, you know, Israel getting ready to attack uh, Iran because they're building a nuclear bomb. And everybody's worried about the nuclear, you know, what's going to happen, nuclear holocaust. You know what? God's hand is on Israel. Amen. When you read the history of the nation of Israel since 1948, God's hand has been on Israel. When they fought the War of Independence in 1948, they had something like four cannons and one tank against all the nations of Arabs around them. They, they had been uh, uh, supplied by uh, the enemies. And they, and they won that battle of independence in the 1967 war. 
Six-day war. They defeated all the Arab armies who were armed by the Russians with MiGs and their tanks and everything. They, they defeated them. Recaptured Jerusalem in the West Bank, what they call the West Bank. Miracle of God. And I heard a God say a couple days ago, uh, Brother, uh, Brother Chuck and I were downstairs in the office, and I had, I had, uh, I had the uh, Sky Angel on the computer. And there was a guy on there who made a movie called Against All Odds. He was talking about this. In 1973, when Richard Nixon was president, the, 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 the Israeli, uh, Israelis, they were surrounded by the Arabs. And Gola Meir asked the United States for help. And Henry Kissinger said, we ain't going to give you no help. Remember Henry, Henry Kissinger? Remember him? Dr. Strangelove? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we, he said, we ain't going to give you any help. Gola Meir called Richard Nixon at 3 o'clock in the morning. And said, if you don't help us, we're done. And Richard Nixon, this is what this guy said. Now, I'm, I'm just quoting what this fellow said. He did research, so I'm hoping it's true. I haven't checked it out. But he said that Richard Nixon, his mother was a Quaker. His mother told Richard Nixon, he said, someday, when he was a little boy, he said, someday you're going to be a great man that's going to help the nation of Israel. And Richard Nixon remembered that. And he was really no friend of Israel, by the way, in his, in his administration. He wasn't. But after Golda Meir made that phone call, he made a, an executive order, said, give them whatever they need. And they survived that war because God moved. God's on their side. So I don't have to be afraid of, if Israel wants to go launch a strike on Iran, I ain't worried about it because God's on their side. And I'm on their side too. Okay. I got a little off track, but listen to what he said. He says, <clears throat> verse 22, Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree bears her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. In, in, in terms, agricultural terms, that means, man, you're going, to get, you're going to get a crop this year like nothing you never had. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you, here's a promise. I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Don't worry. If, listen, if I cause the disaster, I'm going to restore it. If you call upon me, if you fast and pray and call out in repentance, I'll make up what was lost. And really, more than what was lost. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. Now listen, verse 28. Now here we go. Now we're, see, Joel is expanding his vision. He's looking forward. Forward, forward. And he says this, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Sound familiar? And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And upon also the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. Peter quoted this on the day of Pentecost. He said, this is that which the prophet Joel, when they said, what's going on here? And everybody was speaking in tongues and acting like crazy Pentecost. Everybody said, what's going on here? These guys are drunk. And Peter said, these guys ain't drunk. Not, not like you think. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. So what we see on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was given and the church was born, the body of Christ, we see the beginning of a series of events that's going to lead to the return of Jesus Christ. He said the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. That hasn't happened yet. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be good. The Apostle Paul quoted this in Romans. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall not be ashamed. Not just the Jew. Not just the male, female, men, women, old, young. Whosoever. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now he's looking forward to the time 
when God will have him a people, now he has a, a, a people called the church made of Jew and Gentile. And we're called to be his ambassadors. We're called to be his representatives. We're called to preach the gospel. But there's coming a time of restoration for his natural earthly people, Israel. Everything has happened. The Holocaust. All that stuff before, you know, the, the, the stuff that he was talking here, talking about this locust plague. But look at everything that's happened to the nation of Israel and to Jews throughout the last 2,000 years. And look where they're at now. They're sitting on the seat of world conflict right now. The world's ready to blow up because of what's going on with the nation of Israel. At least that's the way it seems. See, God has had his hand on them for 2,000 years. Yes, they've gone through the Holocaust. Yes, they've gone through ghettos. Yes, they've gone through persecution. But all to the, for the point that God is preparing them to once again be his people. If you go back to Jeremiah and read in, uh, 30, 31, 32, he says, no more will you teach one another, but I'm going to write my law in your heart to the nation of Israel. The time is coming. Now look at chapter 3. For behold, in those days and in that time will I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, if you were to look on a map of ancient Israel and look for a place called the valley of Jehoshaphat, you might have trouble finding it. They're not sure exactly what valley they're talking about. Some people might think it's talking about the valley of uh, Armageddon. That's not it because we're not talking about that battle here. Jehoshaphat was, of course, a king of Israel. The, the name means God judges. So listen to what he says. It's really the valley of judgment. And will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. There's going to come a time. It's going to be before the millennium when there's going to be a judgment of the nations on this earth. Not talking about the great white throne judgment. That's at the very end. After the millennial reign. Not talking about the beam of seat Christ, uh, uh, judgment seat of Christ. Where believers, our works are going to be judged. But there's going to be a judgment at the return of Christ before he establishes his kingdom. A judgment of all the Gentile nations of the earth. This is what he says. He says, they've cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. They've been doing that for 2,000 years. Yea, and, they, uh, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold to the Greeks that you might remove them far from their border. What's been going on? The dispersion. Since the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. And, and since the, uh, uh, the revolt in like 130 A.D. when the Romans kicked the Jews out of Jerusalem. Ever since then they've been scattered, pushed from one place to another, persecuted. Yet God's hand has been with them. He says, Behold, I will raise them out of the place where you have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. My goodness, after World War II and after the Holocaust, Jews started flocking to Israel because they finally had their homeland back again. And I will sell your sons and daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabians, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken it. Verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Make up the mighty man. Let all the men of war draw near. Go ahead. Bring all your armies. Get them all together. Go ahead. Come against Israel. Go ahead. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen and gather yourselves together around about. There cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. After that battle of Armageddon, after Christ comes in judgment and, de and defeats the armies of the world, there's going to be a great judgment of Gentile nations. Jesus talked about it. We're going to look in a minute. 
He says, put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The vats overflow for their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Boy, that sentence, that plays good for, you know, for like a salvation message. But it has nothing to do with, with you know, what we call, you know, inviting people to come and know the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that works well, you know, you know, in the valley of decision. But this valley of decision really isn't what we're thinking of. It's a valley of judgment. It's not the people's decision. It's God's decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon and is be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem in the heavens, and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall you know that I am the Lord God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her. Turn with me for a minute over to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. I want you to see what Jesus said about this judgment, I believe. Look at verse 31. It says this. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set them the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He's going to be speaking to the Gentile nations who were friendly to Israel. There will be Gentiles who will be friendly to Israel in those last days. Even as today. Even though there are fewer and fewer. But listen to what he says. He says, I was hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. So now again, we read this and we kind of apply it to ministry and what we do. And that's a good thing. We should visit the sick and visit people in prison and do those things. But this isn't really dealing with that. This is dealing with how Gentiles treated Israel. And how they've treated them over the last 2,000 years. But it's going to be to the people alive during that day. He says, he says uh, I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous saying, When did we see you a hunger and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? And when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, my brethren, you have done it unto me. There's going to be people during that time of tribulation. After the church is taken out, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be saved during that time. And there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be friends of Israel during that time. And when they come to this end, if they're still alive at the end of that tribulation, if they have not given their lives and sacrifice, and they, and they stand before God, they stand before Christ, He says, you took care of my people. And Christ is going to welcome them in. We know the rest. He's going to say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed them to everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they say, answer him, saying, When did we do that? He'll say, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. See, Joel expanded his vision from the time he was living until time that has not happened yet. Let's just read the last few verses of Joel and then we'll close. This world Everything, geopolitical activity in this world is lining up exactly as the Bible says it should. See, that's why we don't have to be afraid. 
when we hear about Iran and Iraq and, you know, the Arab Spring and these things we've been talking about, we don't have to be concerned. I've talked about this before. There's going to be a war, a psalm. Go home, read Psalm 83. There's going to be a war. Israel is going to be miraculously victorious. And it's going to set things up for the end time war, the Armageddon war. Okay? It's a few more verses and we're going to close. We'll finish the book. Read the whole book tonight. See, see how, he read the whole book of the Bible tonight. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. And a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. Isn't it interesting to me that Egypt, you know, Egypt has been in the Bible since all the way back. And isn't it interesting that this latest uh, revolt they had in Egypt, everybody's talking about democracy in Egypt. Oh, they want a democratic government. They got rid of Mubarak, okay. But now, you know who's running the place? The Brotherhood. The Islamic Brotherhood. That hates America. It's not going to turn into a democracy. It's going to turn into Sharia law. That's what, that's what they're going to have in Egypt. It got worse. He mentions Edom. You know, you know where Edom is? Edom is Jordan. All those nations, are, they're, they're, they're experiencing in Syria, in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, they're experiencing people revolting against the governments that are, because they're Islamic, but they've been kind of like buddies, or at least tolerant of Israel in the United States. The Arab world is rising up. The Islamic world is rising up against Israel and against what they perceive as Western imperialism in the United States. This was happening in the world. Just what the Word said is going to happen. It says, But Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord delivers, dwells in Zion. All the blood that had been shed over 2,000 years of the Israelites in persecution will be avenged by God. Nobody gets away with anything. See, that's why when that guy came in here one time, he says, why you got a, a Jewish flag hanging there? I says, I want to be their friend. I said, I, want to, I might not agree with everything the nation of Israel does, but I want to be their friend. Because my Lord was a Jew. And the Bible says, if I bless them, they'll bless, God will bless me. See, I, I don't believe I'm going to be here for that, for that sheep and goat thing. Well, if I'm here, I'm going to be sitting behind Christ, not in front of him. Okay. But if I was there, I'd want, I'd want him to say to me, come. I'd want to be on his right hand. I want to be a friend of Israel. Because throughout God's word, he tells us what's going to happen. Jesus Christ is coming back to reign from Mount Zion. That's where his throne's going to be. And God's going to bless. All those that bless him, and he's going to curse all those that curse him. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody questions or comments or anything before we close tonight?